start. Good afternoon, everybody, and uh, Ramadan Kareem to all of our Muslim colleagues uh, joining us. Welcome to the uh, DXBPE Teaching Through Teams 101 webinar. Uh, for those of you that don't know, DXBPE is uh, professional development for teachers by teachers, and it is the professional development branch of DASA, which is the Dubai affiliated school sports association representing 81 schools here in Dubai. However, we are open to absolutely everyone and this is event, event is certainly for all subjects and all teachers that are using Microsoft Teams for their distance learning. Um, this is part three of the uh, webinars that we've been delivering. Um, so far, 766 teachers from literally around the world have joined in on these webinars. So it's been really, really successful. And thank you for you to, to you for joining us today. Um, if you're on Twitter, we would encourage you to tweet throughout the event um, about things that you like and questions that you have and things that you've learned. Uh, please use the hashtags Teams Tips 101 and hashtag Microsoft Edu, uh, E-D-U. We will, um, that way we can catch up on what everybody's thinking as well uh, afterwards on Twitter. Um, right, what you can expect today, you can expect a live demonstration of the key functions of Microsoft Teams for educators um, within an educational con context, uh, sorry, context. Um, we'll cover some assessment tools, uh, insights into how you can monitor the engagement of your students and also how to utilize the files section within Teams. We'll also cover your frequently asked questions. So we've got uh, two uh, leaders from schools that have implemented Microsoft Teams, so they know the frequently asked questions of teachers. But we can also um, encourage you to use the Q&A function on your on your screen. Um, we have a Microsoft Teams expert with us today, as well as our two teachers. So we will be answering those questions live throughout. Thank you to those of you that have already posted. And um, you should see some uh, replies already going there. So um, I'd like to introduce the panelists, first of all. Um, so first we have uh, Basil. Uh, Basil, if you'd just like to say hello, please. Uh, thanks, Ed. Um, hi, my name is Basil Ajlani. Uh, I work for Microsoft uh, or have been working for the past uh, five years uh, as the education solutions specialist in the region. And basically what that means is I work with schools and teachers and kind of help them in learning how to use uh, our solutions in the classroom. Um, I might have worked with uh, some of you attending the session before. Uh, more than happy to be here. Thank you, Basil. Um, yeah, a great opportunity for you all to ask questions uh, to Basil today. Uh, it's not very often you get someone from Microsoft on hand that you can ask the questions you want to ask. Um, next, I'm going to introduce Niall Statham. Hi, everyone. My name is Neil Statham. I work at Heartland International School in Dubai. I'm the head of PE there. I'm also on the senior leadership team. And I've been doing a lot of work with the school in the digital rollout of Microsoft Teams. So we're in our six week of distance learning and we use Microsoft Teams all the way from year one to year 10. So lots of students using Microsoft Teams at the same time and lots of great success stories and ideas to share with you. Thank you, Neil. And uh, next we have Matt. Hi, I'm, uh, I'm Matt Dunn. Um, I'm the Head of Computer Science at North London Collegiate School here in Dubai. Um, and much the same as, as Neil, I've been helping uh, with the rollout of digital learning and the uh, Teams platform uh, through our distance learning over the last few weeks. Thank you all. Um, so this session is going to be recorded and um, we will download it and we will uh, post it online, just keep an eye on the, the Twitter handles of uh, Neil and myself. Um, we'll get it uploaded to YouTube or somewhere accessible for you guys to watch back as well. So please uh, enjoy, make notes, and um, we're going to send uh, Basil live first, and he's going to demonstrate some of the key uh, features of Microsoft Teams for education. Basil, over to you. Just... Thank you, Ed. Uh, can you see my screen? Yeah, perfect. 
OK, so uh, what I'm going to do during my session is uh, just walk you through some of the uh, basics of Microsoft Teams uh, and some of the tips and tricks of using it that some um, teachers might not necessarily uh, know about. So uh, maybe a lot of you know how to use uh, Teams or you've seen someone use it before uh, from a general point of view in, in terms of uh, you know conducting online sessions. Uh, how do I add my students to a class? Uh, and so on and so forth. So what I'm going to do with uh, within my session is just walk you through some features or some uh, features which you can use in an educational scenario, which maybe you have not thought of uh, before. So um, what I do, what I have here within my screen is, uh, of course, Teams open through a web browser. Um, I'm using the current application, of course, to attend this uh, call. So if I just uh, full screen this. You can see that I have a lot of different teams here. So um, this is because I use this account for dem demo purposes most of the time. So I create more and more teams uh, the more demos that I do. So uh, it, for those of you who are not familiar with how Teams looks, uh, it, it basically looks something similar to this where you have this uh, kind of uh, bar at the left hand side of the screen with different buttons. Um, the most two important buttons, which I would suggest that you go through is the chat button, which allows you to have one to one communication with other people within the school uh, and the teams button, which would actually contain the groups which you would create or which IT would create for you. So within the teams button, you can see that you have a lot of different groups here. Um, most of the groups which you will be working with will be uh, classes uh, where you have a group, you have your students added to the class. And then you can use that group to share a lot of content with them as well. So I'm going to just go into one of my teams that I have here. And uh, please feel free to ignore some of the content available here on the screen. This is just used for demo purposes. Um, the first thing I would like to go through is the general layout, uh, which again, some of you might be familiar with, but um, uh, some others might not. So on the top, you have a few tabs. Uh, each tab allows you to access a different part of Teams. On the left, you have what we call channels, which we'll talk a bit uh, more about uh, during the session. Uh, and then the bottom, you have a couple of different buttons within the posts tab, which allow you to share a lot of type of content with uh, students. So um, uh, when you're trying to share content with students, there's of course a, a lot of different types of content you wanna share. So maybe you just want to send a quick message to remind them of a quiz that they have tomorrow. Uh, maybe you want to, uh, send them a link to an interesting website that maybe has some content that you shared within the classroom. Um, and then there are other scenarios where maybe you want to share an announcement. So Microsoft Teams allows you, if you click on the format button, to turn this new conversation um, button right here into an announcement. And what's nice about an announcement is it looks a lot more clear on the screen for students when they're going through um, uh, the content within their teams. So a new conversation will basically be a subject and uh, subject content. Um, if you click on announcement, it'll basically change the way that the uh, message that you're sending out to the students can look like. So you get to type a headline. So for example, it can be uh, like quiz on uh, Sunday. You add a subhead, uh, quiz will cover uh, chapter three, and then you can add some more details on the quiz. For example, um, uh, we will uh, allocate five grades to this quiz. Please make sure to study hard, just as a quick example. Um, uh, what's nice about this is, uh, first of all, it, it will appear in a way that's a lot bigger for the students and a lot easier for them to kind of see and go through. Uh, but you also have the ability to customize this a little bit so you can change the color. If you would like to add a background to this uh, announcement, you can add a background from here. Uh, and then as soon as you post it, it'll look something like this. Uh, so other than just having this um, uh, kind of a, a giant uh, a rectangle, colored rectangle here, which will grab the students' attention to let them know that this is an announcement, you'll also see this red announcement button on the right-hand side of the screen, uh, which will also um, uh, bring it to their attention. So this is just one of the uh, uh, features of Teams which uh, we think teachers should uh, know about. Uh, and they usually kind of, uh, a lot of teachers miss out on it because you do have to switch this new conversation into an announcement 
uh, button as well. Uh, another feature is everyone can reply. A lot of a lot of teachers like to um, set like like to have their announcements um, kind of non-replyable, so that uh, if students have any um, kind of input onto it, they can respond in a separate thread. You can also change the everyone can reply to only you and moderators can reply, which will not allow students to reply directly back to this um, to this thread. Uh, so this is the first uh, type of content uh, we wanted to go through. Uh, the second thing I wanted to talk about is channels. Now, channels uh, are, I think, incredibly important within Teams. They allow you to engage your students in, uh, in, in more than one way. So um, I would like to go through three different scenarios of using channels. Um, and the, the scenario that you would pick as a teacher would, just, would depend entirely on how you run your classroom. So, for example, um, if let's say you're using Teams and this general channel, the main channel for uh, uh, that you use with your classroom, uh, let's say that it gets very crowded. You have students posting in it all the time. You have students discussing a lot of different types of content. Um, this can make it very difficult for you to be able to uh, control how uh, how the how the chat room goes. Um, you might, uh, I mean. I think it's a good thing and generally teachers that I work with think it's a good thing when you see a lot of students going and posting a lot of content, but it can get very difficult to control and maybe a little bit chaotic uh, if there are messages every single day within the general channel. So what a lot of teachers do is they resort to creating additional channels through the add channel button and these channels will help you in threading discussions into different topics. So, for example, what a lot of teachers do is uh, add a chan is keep the general channel for general discussions and then have a separate channel for each uh, chapter that they cover within the course. So let's say I can have chapter one since this is an English um, uh, class. Let's call it chapter one literature. I click on add and then this will pretty much allow the students to respond directly to this channel or post content in this channel if it has to do with literature. So any discussion that has to do with chapter one, instead of going into the general channel, which should be, of course, just a general discussion, they would go into chapter one, post their questions here, maybe have a discussion, and that will allow you as a teacher to be able to kind of organize uh, the ways in which uh, students um, kind, of, kind of post and discuss content. So this is the first way that uh, you can choose to use the channels uh, within the teams and a lot of teachers already do this. Um, the second way is a lot of teachers like to split their class into groups. So as a teacher, maybe I, 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 we're working on a group project. I want to split the class into groups of four or groups of five or groups of three. Um, and what's nice about teams is it actually allows you to do this through the use of channels. So when you go to create a channel, you'll see that you have a privacy section here which will allow you to set this channel as private. So uh, in that case, I can create, uh, let's say student uh, group one. Um, you set the privacy as private. When you set it as private, it basically means that you as a teacher get to decide uh, what students are available uh, or have access to this channel and which students don't. So I'm going to set this as private, click on next. And when you do so, the next page will basically allow you to add students to uh, this channel. So I'm going to add, for example, um, one of the students in my organization. Maybe I add another one. So you get to add them to this channel. Uh, this student is not a member of the team. That's fine. So you get to add all the students that you would like into this channel or into this group. And when you're done, you would literally have a group uh, or, a, or a separate channel for these students to discuss whatever they want to discuss to maybe work on their project. What's really nice about this is the teacher has visibility over all the channels that they create, whether they're public channels uh, open to the whole class or their private channels. So the teacher can go from student group one to student group two to student group three to student group four, uh, see the way that they're working, the kind of discussions that they're having and maybe provide them with feedback as well. Um, and again, since I said this as a private channel, the students who are not included in this group cannot see this group and they cannot see the content within it either. So uh, this is how you can kind of uh, create 
uh, groups for students to, to, to kind of work in. Um, the last type of usage of uh, channels that I would like to go through is uh, uh, just a, a very generic uh, a type of usage, which is something like this. So if I would like to um, create a specific section that maybe does not has nothing to do with the chapters that we're covering, has nothing to do with uh, the different groups within the class. I just want to create, let's say, a student feedback section to let me know what's uh, what's working and what's not working within Teams, what kind of things they're having difficulty with. I can create that channel and have them kind of, um, uh, you know, share their voice through this channel um, with with everyone. So channels again are incredibly important. I highly suggest that you really think of the way that you would like to create channels, uh, the, the the different methods that you would like to use when having channels with uh, uh, with shared with students. Just so you know, you do you have a maximum of, or Teams allows for a maximum of two hundred channels within one team. Um, 30 of them can be private channels. So the, the, the limit for the private channels is 30. The limit for the, uh, 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 you know, the total number of channels within one team is 200. What I would suggest is do not make the number of channels go above 10. The main reason for this is it can get confusing for students. If you have more than 10 channels, it'll, it'll create more kind of uh, pages for them to access, which can get a little bit confusing. So my suggestion personally from working with teachers is have a maximum of 10 channels uh, for your students to go through. Um, OK, so this is uh, the second uh, type of content I wanted to share with you. Uh, but the third type of content uh, is um, uh, shown in the assignments page. So assignments and teams allow you to create one of two things. It allows you to create um a uh, an assignment to share with your students which allows them to work on it of course through teams turn it in through teams and then you can receive the assignment and you can provide feedback and grade it and it will allow you to create uh quizzes as well so the way that this works is okay the way that this works is if you go to the assignments tab click on create you'll see two different main uh, point, uh sections the first one is a regular homework assignment the second one is a quiz um, I'll, uh, maybe we'll go through the quiz later on during the session. I'm not sure if um, uh, if uh, Matt or uh, Neil or Ed are, are going through uh, how to create that. But um, for you to know, once you click on quiz, you'll basically be asked to select a form from the forms app, which is provided to your Office 365 account. Um, so then you can select a form or you can click on create new form that will open up a web page which allows you to create the quiz there. Um, so that will allow you to, of course, create an automatically graded quiz and add it directly to the, uh, to the class or share it with the class with a deadline or with everything. Um, let's talk about the assignment for a bit. So if I click on create and click on assignment, I get a page where I can uh, add the details of the assignment I'm going to create, uh, like a title, some instructions, maybe add some resources. So uh, I would like to go through two main points here. So when it comes to adding resources, there are uh, usually as a teacher, there are uh, two different types of resources that you would want to share with your students. The first type would be a document that maybe you want them to study from. Maybe it's a PowerPoint presentation, maybe it's a PDF, maybe it's a Word document, maybe it's a video, maybe it's a picture. Um, and uh, the second type, uh, is a document which you want them to work on. Maybe a fill in the blanks document, maybe a document with questions uh, written down with spaces for them to input their answer. So you can do both of these things within the assignment section. So as soon as I click on add resources, it opens a page that allows me to upload resources either directly from my OneDrive or uh, from my device. And you, of course you have a couple of other options from here. Um, let's say I have a PowerPoint presentation I want my students to study from before working on the assignment. So I can go to my OneDrive or upload it from my device, click on that PowerPoint presentation and click on attach, and that will add the PowerPoint presentation uh, directly to the, um, uh, to the assignment. Now you can see here that it says students cannot edit. So this is very, very important when you're sharing a uh, an assignment with students if you don't if you want this to be read only for the students within the assignment you can share it here 
uh, and select that students can't edit this assignment, uh, this this uh, file, which will mean that they, they can only study from it. Uh, alternatively, if I have another, let's say, Word document that I want them to uh, to kind of edit, let's say I'm going to share this uh, collaboration document. I want them. Well, this is a bad example. Let's say uh, I'm going to share this um, Arabic document here, just a document which they can open and they can edit directly from their device. I can share it and then change the properties of a document to allow each student to edit their own copy. So once I select this uh, selection on a document sharing within the assignments, each student within my class will get their own copy of this document. So Microsoft Teams from the back end will copy this document, create, let's say, 20 copies of it if I have 20 students within my class and share that copy with each individual student so they can work on it from within Teams without being able to see the other students uh, uh, documents and changes as well. So these two types of attachments that you add to assignments are very important. Um, one other thing that I would like to go over very quickly is the rubric. Um, Teams does allow you, of course, to dedicate a certain number of points to this assignment. So let's say this assignment is worth 20 points. If I click on add a rubric, this allows you to um, kind of really explain to students what you're looking for with the assignment. So if you have a rubric ready, you can upload it. Otherwise, you can create a new rubric from here. And this, we have this uh, very simple interface which allows you to give the rubric a title, uh, enter a description for the rubric, enter grading criteria, uh, describe exactly what you're looking for within this assignment for students, what you consider to be excellent, what you consider to be good, fair or poor. And students will be able to see this uh, before answering the assignment. So students, so you'll have that type of uh, kind of communication between you and the students, the kind of transparency. So they can, first of all, see exactly what you're asking for within this assignment, understand what you're looking for and work based on that. What's really nice about this is you can even split uh, the different portions based on the number of points. So as an example, if this is, let's say, an essay that, uh, that my students are working on, um, I can give points for grammar, I can give points for clarity, I can give points for whatever else I would like to give points on. And then what I can do is even split the grades, a percentage of the grades based on these four different categories. Um, and uh, of course, I can add more sections if I would like from the top as well. So this will um, allow you to, again, have that level of transparency that you would like to have with your students uh, and to let them know exactly what you're looking for and what they're being graded on. Um, if you create a rubric from here and uh, attach it, uh, it, it, you can also save the rubric directly so that you can reuse it a little bit later on if you would like with other assignments, with other classes or with other teams as well. So uh, rubric is, a, is, I think, is a, a very important uh, part of teams which uh, will allow you to kind of share an assignment uh, with the students in a very kind of unique way. So let's call this assign uh, homework, let's say eight. Um, so uh, you can assign it, of course, to multiple classes if you would like from here. It'll open up all the teams that you're a part of. You can assign it to all students or just specific students if you would like to as well. Set a due date, due time, click on assign. And as soon as you do this, this will be shared automatically with the students and they'll be able to open it from within their uh, devices. They'll be able to view it and they'll be able to um, uh, submit it directly from within the Teams application. Um, of course, once you submit an assignment, it will post about it within the posts page, and I'll show you how it looks like in a bit. Uh, one thing I wanted to show you is if you would like to see how a student would view the assignment, there it is, it just posted about it within the general tab. Uh, if you would like to see how the student will view the assignment on their page, all you have to do as a teacher is go to the assignment section, click on the homework you've um, submitted to the students and you'll get this student view at the top. So if I click on student view, it'll open the assignment exactly how students will see it on their device with, uh, with all the details, the instructions uh, and the reference material that you've added. You can see that you have reference material 
which is the PowerPoint presentation. I did not allow them to edit. You'll see a student's work, which they can click on and edit directly with it on the page itself. Um, and you'll see how they can kind of uh, work on their assignment directly from within Microsoft Teams. Uh, one thing I would like to highlight here is, uh, let me just try to open up another assignment within another team uh, that maybe I've worked on. <clears throat> OK, um, one really nice thing about. Uh, assignments is as a teacher, after you submit an assignment to students, you'll be able to see uh, if students have viewed the assignment, even if they have not actually worked on it. You can see if uh, they uh, if they turned it in or if they haven't. So. Um, uh, I think this uh, assignment has has ended, so it, it doesn't really show, but if you open the assignments page, you'll be able to see which students turned in the assignment, uh, which students viewed it and which students just did not open the assignment yet. And on any assignment that you've uh, that a student has worked on, you can click on it. It'll open the document they've submitted and you can provide them with uh, feedback uh, or comments, of course, um, directly onto the document uh, or feedback on the right as well as points. Uh, one last thing I would like to go through, I think I'm running out of time is uh, the tabs button at the top. So you have five main tabs. If you would like to add additional tabs, you can click on the plus sign, uh, which is just available here. So you can click on the plus sign. It'll open up this page where you can select from a bunch of different applications that you can add. Um, maybe some of you use some of these applications like Sociable, um, like um, uh, SurveyMonkey, like Poly. Um, uh, and you can add some, uh, let's say, let's say you have an important Word document like a syllabus, you can pin it to the top of the team so students can ha have quick access to it. Let's say there's a website that you encourage your students to access all the time because it has a lot of great resources. You can use the website tab uh, to add it as a tab at the top. Um, so these are just, uh, I think, a few uh, tips from my side. Um, I hope this was helpful. I'm going to uh, pass the mic along to uh, to Ed, um, and they'll walk you through a couple of more um, uh, very helpful tips as well. Thank you very much, Basil. Um, I hope everyone found that useful. Um, just so we everyone knows the expectations of this session, this is uh, Teams 101. So uh, Basil is covering the, the basics there. Matt and Neil will, will do similar, and we hope to have future sessions that we'll, we'll cover more. So if you're someone sat there and you're a bit more, you know these things already, um, we will have future sessions that are more advanced and even Neil and uh, Matt coming up next will uh, will cover extra things for you. Just to encourage everybody to um, please use the Q&A function. Um, if you see a question on there that you want the answer to, give it a thumbs up, give it a vote, um, and that will bump it up the list. And um, if we can't answer it by typing, if it's best to show you, and um, if it's not covered during the next two presentations, we will certainly come back and cover it at the end if we've got the time. So um, now I think I'm going to bring through uh, Matt. Matt, are you ready? And I'm just going to send him live for you first. Super. Uh, Ed, if you could push through my screen share, that'd be great. Thank you. Yes. Super. Right. Um, so I just thought I'd, I'd take you through uh, two real aspects here. Um, the first one is to go through a couple of the um, questions that I get asked most frequently as a, a part of um, helping in my school with with the rollout for teams. And the second is then just to show you the file section uh, that is a part of every team and how we can use this to be uh, a bit more organized and a bit more communicative of our files with our students. So those first two um, FAQs that I get asked really recall, um, really uh, pertain to some of the questions that have been asked already around pre-recording meetings and how we adjust meeting sessions. So they're both really uh, couched very definitely in the calendar feature. So if we want to try and pre-record a meeting, something that I, I get asked all the time is that we are recording a, a live session inside of uh, one of our teams and the students join our meeting whilst we're trying to record and it, and it throws things out. 
that's fine if we holding a meeting inside of a team is absolutely fine if we want the pupils to be able to join but if we want to be able to to do this where uh, we don't want to be disturbed by anybody the easiest way is just in calendar and to use meet now now when we select meet now um, we will uh, get a couple of different options. I can't select this at the moment because of this live events going on. Um, but we get a couple of different options and essentially we can record all of our uh, presentation without anybody else being a participant. When we end it, it's just like ending a normal meeting. If we haven't recorded the content of that meeting, it will be lost. So we need to make sure that we have recorded uh, clicking on the ellipses in the uh, central bar for the meeting and then selecting start recording. Once you have recorded your uh, presentation and that that has then uploaded itself, that will be over in uh, Stream, which is a part of the, the Office platform. I'll ask Ed to send through um, a PDF to you all later on that shows you uh, the technique that you can go through to open that meeting up to the relevant students that you need. Um, because once you've recorded it uh, initially through the calendar app, that won't then be available to everybody that you want it to be without changing some of the permissions. It's only a couple of clicks. It's not a particularly long process, but uh, but it makes your life a little bit easier to stop being disturbed whilst you're trying to create a recorded lesson content. The second aspect is how we can adjust our meeting sessions, which is where a couple of the questions came up. Um, I've created here for tomorrow on Thursday just a, a dummy meeting. And when I click on this, I've just given it some really basic settings and initially I clicked save. Once that meeting has run through its cycle of being created, we can come back into the meeting settings and we have this button here that's available to us, which is meeting options. This wasn't available to us when we were creating the meeting. And if we click on meeting options, this will load up into a web browser the options that we have available to us for limiting some of the behaviours of pupils within our meetings. So we have the options to bypass lobbies. That's really down to you and how your school have rolled that out. I know certainly for us, uh, we disable the ability for people to be able to dial into our meetings who don't have an account. So this isn't particularly pertinent to, to me and, and our applications within our school. Uh, but who can present is definitely something that's that's relevant for us, where you can just click on this and then you can select who you want to be able to present within your meeting. Uh, generally speaking, only me is the one that suffices, I think, for most people, but you can select specific people if you would like to name certain pupils who might be given a, a presentation during a particular lesson. This really allows us to control who joins a meeting as a presenter and an attendee. You can set people once you're inside of a meeting if you haven't gone through this cycle, you can manually make everybody an attendee and that removes their ability to mute everybody. It removes their ability to present and it removes their ability to kick people out of the meeting. So you can do that um, just by clicking on their name in the meeting and selecting make attendee. But if you've got a, a class where you've got you know, upwards of 10 uh, pupils and certainly when we get into the, the boundaries of, of 20 plus, that becomes a bit of a pain to have to go through and do that individually. Basil might be able to confirm this in the uh, Q&A section, but I do believe that a feature is being rolled out by Microsoft over the next couple of weeks uh, that will manually, sorry, will automatically make all students join as attendees and all teachers join as presenters. So the people who have asked the question, how can we do this without going into the meeting session, uh, settings? I believe that is something that's been rolled off uh, by Microsoft uh, imminently within the next couple of weeks. So hopefully that kind of, yeah, super, super. Um, so hopefully that, that sort of answers some of those main questions that we've been asked about meetings. Um, and they're certainly the, the most frequent questions that I get are the, the problems that people are having. So let's just go back and have a look at these. Uh, file settings now. So one of the options in the top menu bar uh, is files. And really by default, this comes with one folder inside of it, which is class materials. It doesn't look particularly impressive at the start of it. Uh, but if we work our way along these option bars that we have at the top, um, new pretty much speaks for itself, um, but we're able to create specific uh, documents within our um, uh, folder structure here that sit within sort of the, the office 
um, file system. We can upload from our computer just by selecting this and working our way through whichever uh, particular file structure we want to have a look at on our computers. But this sync is quite interesting. If you click on sync, this will set up with OneDrive um, the folder structure within this files tab to be synced to your computer. And I'll show you where that sits now. So if I now open up my file browser, you can see that I've got my normal personal uh, OneDrive account, which is where all of my uh, individual school files go. But you can also see that I have this additional section up here. And this talks about uh, the areas or the different teams, or if we got into the background of this, different SharePoint instances where we are saving and syncing files to. And you can see that I've got webinar demonstration here, which is the name of this team that I've created for this particular webinar. So if I click on this, um, any files or folders that I now drop into this area will be synced between my computer and the team. So it just makes it a little bit easier to be able to store files um, and to be able to work with those on your own computer. It also means that any files that get uploaded to the team by other people will be pulled down to your computer. So it makes life a little bit easier across the board. We can download files quite easily just by selecting the download link. Um, and I'm not going to get too far into cloud storage or SharePoint because I think they're pretty much beyond the scope of this particular session. But if anybody has any questions on them, I'm happy to take them later on. Class materials, uh, the default folder that comes in here is a read only folder. So any files that I drop into this area are going to come up by default as a, as a read only uh, instance. This is useful um, if we've got things like Word documents or Excel spreadsheets or anything else along those lines um, that are editable files, but we don't want students to actually be able to change or to manipulate. We can drag and drop those straight into this folder here um, and that will allow uh, or force pupils to download them if we want them to be able to make edits. Back inside of the general tab, we can instead um, just upload different files. So I have um, here a selection of PDFs that I've been working on uh, that show different ways of using Teams. And if I drag and drop these over, students now can interact with them, they can download them. Because these are PDFs, they still won't be able to um, edit these files. But if I were to drag over any form of editable file, then they'll all be able to edit this one instance. That's the biggest drawback with placing files um, into this area that need editing, is that all students will be editing the same instance of the file, which is great for some things. It can get a little bit chaotic if every pupil in a class is editing away. The final thing really that I just want to show you links back into the assignments and from what Basil was saying earlier on, uh, when we create an assignment and we attach a file, when we add a resource, we have uh, a whole selection of places that we can add our files in from. Uh, but one of them is Teams. So any files that you uploaded either to another team or indeed into this particular team, you can gain access to. So files becomes a really useful place to be able to store and manipulate um, files for your individual team, but also to be able to section those off so you can use them uh, within other assignments on other teams. Uh, happy to take any more questions about files, but that really is all I've got to say, so I'm happy to pass back to Ed. Thank you, Matt. So, so far we've covered the um, some of the basic key features um, by Basil there at the beginning. Um, Matt's gone into a few extra things for you there, that, how you can incorporate and organise your files and documents. Um, thank you for your questions. I hope we've answered a few of them, especially that one about um, keeping students muted and removing their abilities during meetings to do certain things. And we're going to hand over now to uh, Neil and Neil's going to look at assessments within Teams and how you can get insights through assessment. Hi everyone, just to reintroduce myself again, my name is Neil Statham, I work at Heartland International School. So I'm going to be showing you some of the features that we've used uh, to do some quick assessments and some of the things that Basil touched on there about getting information in real time from your kids like you might try to do in the classroom and how you can create some assessments which are self-marking 
which is going to save you hopefully a lot of time. So I'm going to share my desktop with you now. Ed, if you could push that into the live feed for me. Fantastic. OK, so here we are in, uh, in Office 365. So in, uh, in Blue Peter style, for those of you from the UK, here's one I made earlier. So this is the type of form that you could produce for your students that's engaging, it's interactive, it's multiple choice, it's nice and easy to fill in, and it includes lots of media to capture their imagination. So these are the kind of things that you can create. Uh, this one took me less than 10 minutes to put together. And why should you, why should you use this? Well, you can also get all sorts of information from your students. So I asked some colleagues from my department to fill out this for you to see the kind of information that you can get. So as, as or as soon as your students have filled in these quizzes, you can get detailed information like this, which is going to help you analyse what the strengths and weaknesses of the students are and also where the issues might be with the content. So I can see on each of my questions, the answers that students chose, how many of them answered the questions correctly. And I can also drill down into those even further. If I review their answers, I can review by student. So I can look at one of my students, I can see what they got correct, and I can also see which answer they selected that was incorrect. I've got a real uh, an ability to flick from student to student without having to leave this. And I can also see their auto grade, and I can click here and I can give them even further feedback on it as well. It also shows me how long students spent answering the whole quiz as well, so I can tell if someone has rushed it. I can go by question as well, so this shows me what the average score on each of the questions I put in my quiz was, so I can straight away see where, where the misconceptions are in the information that I've tried to deliver to students and where I might want to focus my efforts on next. So hopefully hopefully that's enough to, to whet your appetite on why. If that wasn't enough, you can also in your information export it all to Excel as well. So if I click here, I'll be able to download all this information for all my students. And as Basil mentioned, you can do this as an assignment. So once I've made the format we're going to show you today, we'll be able to attach this as an assignment for students. So instead of maybe then taking photos of written work or typing onto a Word document, if you want to come up with something different for them, you might want to produce uh, a quiz. So to get here, I've just logged into Office 365 and I can see Microsoft Forms is an option. So once I've clicked that, it's going to take me to a screen a little bit like this and I'm ready to make a quiz. So the first thing it allows you to do is the is the cosmetics. You can set different themes or different uh, different picture styles or backgrounds for it and you can dress it up however you like to make it engaging for students. You give your quiz a title and you can also add some media to it as well. So if I click on here, I've got an option to search straight away onto the internet or I can upload any pictures that I want. Once I'm happy with the design, I'm ready to start writing questions for students. So I've got the option to do multiple choice questions, text based answers, ratings. And if I click here, I've also some of these will touch on later, but ranking questions, which of these is the most important, put them in order and the file upload, which we'll come back to, which is great as well. But let's start with the multiple choice question. And I can put it in here so I could say which animal is the largest? And then I can start to enter my options here. And you'll notice as I start to put in the questions, these boxes come up here. So if I want to make this self marking, I just press the tick and then this is the correct answer. Students choose this when they get the results. It will tell them this is the correct answer. Where it gets really clever is if I click on the speech bubble here, I can send a message direct to anyone who selects this answer. So anyone who presses dog, I can give them auto feedback once they've submitted it and say whatever I wanted to. I can, uh, if it's for secondary students, I might want to relay them to a lecture or a lesson that's taken place already. Or I could even link a website to them if I wanted to. So students will get the, they will get some kind of feedback from you straight away. It might be to redirect them somewhere else or it might be even just as simple as right or wrong. You can allow them to skip answers if you want to 
or if you want them to answer every single question, you just need to click on required here. If you want to make your quiz scored, so if you want to track uh, scores for something, you can add how many points each question is worth as well. If you want to make it a little bit more engaging, like in my example there, I can add media as a stimulus. So if I want to add an image, I can just click here and I'll be able to add anything I want. Or if I click video, I can add a link to a URL from YouTube or even better, I could add a link to a lesson I've recorded on Microsoft Stream if you use that. So you can have students watching clips of past lessons and then answering questions on them as well. Some of the, the slightly more the complicated but equally cool functions of this, I think, are when I set my question, I've got different options here, so I'm just going to minimise that. I can shuffle, so each child who sees the quiz will see the questions in a different order. If I want to, I can change it to a drop down menu instead of click options. And something which we won't cover today, but I can add branching. So that means if I enable that, students who answer a question correctly can move to one section of the quiz. Students who answer with an incorrect answer can be re redirected to something easier. So you can start to personalize the quizzes for them based on their performance in real time, which is a really nice function. If you're a math teacher, uh, hopefully this this will make your day. If you want to make a maths quiz or a maths question, if you click on the ellipses here, you can enable the maths option. So I'm going to ask the students to find the value. In fact, I've got one I made earlier. Uh, here's my maths quiz. So you can see there, here's the one I've done on find the values of X. So let's add another maths question. We'll say a PE teacher maths is going to come into question here. What is the value of X and we're going to make it a maths question. And it's going to, as soon as I do that, it's going to give me this maths function. So I could say, uh, let's have, we'll have X squared plus three is equal to 39. Oh, I need to just add my X in here as well. X squared plus three is equal to 39 and press OK. And no, it's not. It's not giving me. I've got the wrong. I've got the wrong X. That's why. Let's change. Let's have. Uh, let's have X squared equals thirty six. Let's keep it simple. So straight away, it's come up with the correct answer for it, and it knows it's the correct answer. Not only that, it's suggested alternate answers for me to put in as well. If I click Add All, straight away, it's done that part of the work for me. When I come to add a new question, it also suggests other questions that I might want to put in the quiz, which is a further time saver. So it suggested that I have uh, this question here. If I click on that and I say, yeah, I want to include that. And then I add it to my quiz. Straight away, it's there. It's suggesting correct. It knows what the correct answer is and it's suggesting other options for it as well. Something which I, I've only recently discovered, which I really like, is you can also add a file upload section as a question. So within your quiz, you can embed the option for students to upload a file, which will go to a set uh, set area on your OneDrive. It's a little bit more advanced, but it allows you to create a really engaging quiz that might challenge students to do different kinds of work or respond to different types of media. Uh, the last, last section I'm going to show you on this is the, the settings and sharing. So in my settings, if I want to, I can enable here the show results automatically. So if I want the students to mark their work, or if I want it to be marked and returned to them immediately, I enable this and they'll get it. Or I can disable likewise. I can make sure I've got my student names uh, recorded here as well, which is handy. If you don't have that, you might find yourself scratching your head afterwards. And in the share option, you've got all sorts of great, uh, great tools here. So. I can get a link to duplicate this. If I've made a quiz that someone else in my team really likes, I can just click on the duplicate link and then they've got it. Now they've got their own format or their own version of mine, which they can work on. Or I can share it and get someone to collaborate on this at the same time with me as well. So there are lots and lots of great options within forms. I'm going to show you one final thing in one of my test teams as well, which is called Poly. And this is, a, uh, this is one of the, the app integrations that Basil was talking about. So I've just to add Polly, I've 
just clicked on the plus and then I've clicked on the poly tab here. Now in my lesson, if I want to do maybe a plenary, maybe we've reached the midpoint and I want to find out how students are doing. If I press the at key and then press the letter P, it's going to wake up poly for me and I'm going to, I want it to create a poll. And it gives me some fantastic options to gauge how students are doing. I want to poll, I can choose to send it now or I can schedule it to be later on. So I could schedule a poll for tomorrow to, to begin at the start of the lesson. So as soon as the lesson time starts and students arrive, they have to answer questions that were relevant to the last lesson. I can set times when I want the, the poll to close if I want to, so it could be open for a full week. It might just be a five minute thing. Multiple choice questions uh, are, are what I think are the best use for this. I can set my questions in and I really love this feature where the audience can add choices as well. So I might say to students, who do you think are the two, who do you think is the most uh, important character in this book? And then I can give them some options, but they can also add a further option of their own if they want to. By turning on comments, students can tell me why or what the justification is for their answer. And then you also have some different options here with the results. So you can show the students all the results once it closes, or you can show them the results in real time. So you might want to pose a question mid lesson and then see the results coming in. Or if you want to, you can hide the results or make the questions anonymous. There is a similar feature for Microsoft Forms as well, which you can do mid lesson. If you, when you click on the ellipses, you've got the option to quickly drop in a simple form as well. Oh, I've got an extra window here and it will allow me to ask questions and put in some quick options and then I can send them straight in and then that will appear in my team as a form. Uh, I think that's that's all I want to show you today. I'm going to stop sharing my screen now. I'll put myself back in the box so the live event doesn't disappear and I'm happy to take any questions that you might have about using forms. Uh, please send them in the question box. Thank you, Neil. Um, so now we're on to the, uh, the Q&A section. That's all our presentations. I hope you found that useful. Um, just a reminder, we will record this and we'll, we will share uh, links. We transfer links so you can watch it back and we'll try and upload it to YouTube as well. Um, just going to go through a few of the questions now and I'll like, nip to other panelists to answer. Um, I can answer this one though, the most recent. Do we have to have teams downloaded to be able to watch a live event. So this is a live event. It's not a meeting. It's just the panelists. Um, no, you don't have to. So uh, we've done a live event at our school and assembly um, and the students in the first school, the early years, um, they're, they're not using Microsoft Teams, but their parents were able to tune in anyway. They just have to have the link and they click on the link like you have done today and then you would have had two options, one option to join via Teams and the other the other option to join via the web browser. So if you don't have Teams, you just have to click on the web browser option. However, if they're using uh, an Apple device, um, like an iPad or a phone, they must have the Teams app for that to work. And they don't need to be registered, but they need to have the Teams app. So um, that answers that one. Um, Neil, there's been a few questions on um, safeguarding school protocols things like that um as a senior leader at your school who's implemented teams could you help answer that uh yeah i'm just gonna i'm just gonna quickly scroll through the the question by uh one of the questions was about recording so you can actually disable the ability for students to record lessons as well as one of the as one of the policies within microsoft teams so if that's a concern that something might get recorded uh, inadvertently, then you've got the option to disable that as well. I think wh whatever, you know, I, I wouldn't want to recommend things uh, to, to schools. They've obviously got to work within the, the constraints and the boundaries of their own safeguarding policies. But I think it, it's just about setting clear procedures for students. And if you're new to Teams and you're using it for the first time, spending those first couple of weeks going over the protocols that you want to use. So just simple things like only teachers can only teachers can start meetings. Students are not permitted to start meetings. Once the students get into the meeting, the te they're allowed to have their microphone on to say hello and then they have to turn their microphone off again or the teacher mutes them. And then 
you, you can you can then start to use it as your organization wishes from that point. I think if you're if you're recording, it's always a good idea to have uh, webcams off. But most of the time you're recording content, you're probably going to be sharing a screen anyway. Um, so I think different different schools are handling this differently. Some schools want the students to have their cameras on, uh, depending on age. Other schools have got the students to have their cameras off. So I think that's that's a decision for schools and there are there are different ways of solving that problem. Like for, for our school, something that's worked well is we've disabled the function for students to use the chat to talk to each other. We've disabled their team creation and we've disabled their ability to start calls. So the only places that those can happen are with the teacher present. And we always have multiple teachers in each of the teams as well. So it means that student activity, I guess, is very closely monitored. There are always adults there as there would be in school. Something I think is is it an important and an easy fix as well as getting parents on board with with whichever safeguarding procedures you choose and encouraging people to log out at the end of the day so once students are finished using it and it's on a device the temptation might be to go back to it but if you're using it as an education platform getting students to log out take a break and, and just clear the decks from it at the end of the day is also an important tip thank you neil um Basil, there was a question here, and I think you replied to it in the text, but I think others might like to hear your answer. Um, can we add people to our team that might not necessarily be within our our actual our schools? You know, if I want to add a teacher from another school, or if we're a group of schools and we want to um, collaborate between schools, are we able to do that? Uh, sure. Uh, thank you, actually, for bringing this up because we usually get this question a lot. Um, so uh, uh, the answer is yes. Uh, the thing is if, uh, so the way to do this is basically to just go to your team, uh, click on add members, and then add the full email address of that person that you would like to add to the team. So if I would like to add someone uh, whose user name is whatever, user at uh, dubaischool.com, and they're not within my domain, I would basically go to add member, add that full email address, and they'll be added to the team. If you are not able to do this, uh, re do reach out to your IT admins. Uh, generally, IT admins do have to um, enable uh, uh, guest access within the admin portal from the back end before teachers can add external members. So maybe if you try that and it doesn't work, then your IT admin has not enabled uh, you to actually add external users. Uh, so definitely try that. Um, uh, and on an unrelated note, I want to share also an update uh, with all of you. Uh, there has been a new uh, feature which has been, uh, I think, just released uh, or it's currently rolling out, uh, which is the ability for teachers to uh, end meetings by themselves. So we had a lot of questions earlier um, uh, in different sessions where uh, teachers were complaining about uh, you know, having uh, an ongoing session and then after the session is over, the teacher, uh, you know, closes the session, they leave, and the students are just there in the session, you know, still talking, uh, which as you can imagine can cause a lot of chaos. Um, so we've added a new feature which enables you to, uh, as a teacher, to just end the meeting and that will automatically kick everyone out of the meeting and close it um, and they won't be able to, um, uh, you know, continue their discussion. To access this, uh, you just click on the triple dot menu at the bottom um, you know, in the uh, standard functions tab and you should see an end meeting um, a button there. If you don't see it, do not worry. It should be rolled out uh, for everyone within the next few days. So um, that's that's a, I think that's an exciting feature that's on its way. Excellent. Thank you, Basil. Um, someone's here. Quick question about um, students editing their own copy of a document. You can upload a blank document or something with a table in that you'd like them to complete. Uh, yeah, Basil covered that at the beginning. Um, when you're attaching files to an assignment, um, there's an option, uh, the three dots on the side of that file to change it to um, student can edit their own copy. So if you do that, it makes it quite easy for them to turn that document in as part of their assignment and it's their own copy. Um, that's an important thing to learn and use because if you don't click that, students struggle when it comes up with read only and then they have to save the file on their computer, rename it, upload it again. 
you're keeping things simple with this and the fewer clicks that your students have to do to do things uh, makes a big, big difference. Um, Matt, a question for you. Um, I think you'd already answered it. It was about um, the files and um, someone was saying they'd organise their files and the students couldn't see them correctly. Um, have you got anything to add on that, please? Um, I think I just said it within the answer that um, what I think is happening from, from that question is that they're being shared within OneDrive. So you, you can go into OneDrive, right click and share a file with somebody, which if you're not using Teams is probably the most streamlined way to be able to get files between staff and students. Um, but that doesn't necessarily work all that nicely if you're trying to integrate Teams fully into sort of the teaching experience. Um, for me, and it's I'm, I'm fairly fortunate, I'm a department of one, so I don't really have to corroborate with 100 different people as to how we upload files, but um, I try to keep uh, sort of my working files for each team within that files tab. Um, and then if I'm using something different that I want the students to be able to edit, that then goes into my assignments. And I, try, I personally try to keep those separated out. Um, but that's really just down to having your own policy and something that you apply yourself to the way that, um, that you're going to upload files. Thank you, Matt. Um, so we're just going to go over a few of the questions that have had the most votes. Um, and I think they've been answered, but I just want to make sure everyone's clear. Um, is it possible to see more than four pupils at once on your screen? Um, that is an update that is coming soon and you'll be able to see a three by three grid. So up to nine people on the screen at once, which would be a, a good size. Um, is there a way to make children attendees? Matt covered that quick and easy. Create the meeting um, and then once the meeting's been generated on your calendar, go back to it and, and then just meeting options and then make you the only presenter or make all others attendees to remove those privileges. Um, an exciting uh, update uh, as a PE teacher, I'm excited about this, but anybody who wants to share video with music or, or just better quality sound, you will now be able to, when you share that video in meetings, uh, click enable computer sound, uh, computer audio, and it will come through very clearly, um, whereas before that wasn't an option. Um, Basil's mentioned here that it's within the next week or so. I think I might have saw, saw a tweet today that it's already um, in action. Neil, is that is that correct? That's already available? I'm not sure. Is this the, the sorry, the, the live stream audio? Uh, yeah, the meeting audio when playing yeah, videos. So you, you can share, share system audio in meetings is already there. When, when you click to share your screen, it's very easy to miss. It's just a small box which says share system audio and then in meetings that option is there for you. Yeah, thank you. Great. A um, couple of people have asked, we've had the question a few times about recording meetings within the channels. Um, Basil, is there, I think you've answered this in the text, but could you just explain that verbally for us once more? Uh, sure thing. So um, recording in, in channels does work. Um, however, the channel has to not be a private channel. Uh, as of currently, if you if you're if it's a private channel, you're not able to record the session. However, if it's a standard channel, which uh, all team members can access, you do get the recording button as well, and it works exactly the same as recording within the general tab. Um, the 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 team has been looking at this feature because we have received some demand on it, um, and uh, they're currently evaluating whether this is something. Um, uh, to work on or, or not. Uh, I personally feel like that this is something that they will work on uh, uh, and release, but again, this is just my personal opinion. Um, yeah, that's my answer. Excellent, thank you. Um, and uh, lastly from Neil, um, and I saw you're typing the reply now, but it's talking about stream and um, I know you do lots of video recordings. Could you, would you be happy to share your screen and just show everybody how you use Stream within a team to organize video content that you've shared with them? I'll just send you, send you live, and then once yeah. you've shared your screen. Okay. Okay, my desktop should be there. I'll yeah, find, give me a moment. Find, find the team to go into. There you go. Uh, yes, yeah, so we we use Microsoft Stream uh, to store 
to, to share videos. So it, it looks like this for us at the moment. Um, it's just going to load up. So any videos that we've uploaded for students are there able to see. I think the, the question that was there was about can you are there is there a subfoldering option within stream? There's not at the moment. Um, and I, I, I don't think Basil might correct me, but I don't think it's currently planned either. I think when people use stream, they kind of envisage it as folders and subfolders. But but streams way of organizing it is through groups and through channels. So I think the the best thing that you can do once you've is to sort of set almost like set an expiry date on your stream channel for your videos and then remove them and then you can always make them available for people uh, on demand but we we do a mix of things so we pre-recorded videos we share this way um, if when we're teaching live we obviously use the the meeting function and we also use a live streaming service within this which is how we're broadcasting the webinar today um, so that's something that people might want to look into but Microsoft Stream is just here as an option within Office 365, which you can link to Teams. So all the videos that we have as a school or that we produce that are uh, produced offline, if you like, are uploaded onto Microsoft Stream and then they are shared to students within their within their stream channel just simply by clicking and adding Microsoft Stream and then you can link the videos that you've shared. Brilliant, thank you. And just uh, just leave your screen on for a moment, please. Hi. Oh, sorry. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, go on. I'll, uh, good man. Um, so the good thing about stream, everyone, is that, you know, we started using YouTube initially at my school and the, the issue is the student comes to the end of the video on YouTube and then they might end up going somewhere else within YouTube on suggested media that YouTube pushes forward. So that can quickly become very distracting for students and they could end up on something um, potentially inappropriate. So stream really controls that and keeps them within your school space. So it is worth uh, integrating. If you are creating video content yourself or want to share the, the live introduction to the lesson, it's automatically recorded there and it keeps it organized and easy to find. Um, lastly, Neil, and we'll wrap up with this just so people can find out themselves. Um, if you go into your team, can you just show everybody where the uh, help section is um, and all the yeah. very useful videos that Absolutely. Microsoft create? Yeah, so in the, just here, if you click on the, click on the three dots, the ellipses here, um, you'll see other apps that you might have integrated with Teams, but the help one is always at hand. If you click on that, it's going to open up inside Teams for you. And, and as literally, as it says, tons of teams training. Uh, it's got walkthroughs probably on a lot of the things that we've covered today. And my favorite bit, which I'm always I'm always stalking is the watch new and it tells you about new features that have rolled out when they rolled out. Um, there's also the training option in it as well. So if you haven't been able to get the training wherever you are, there are all sorts of videos on getting started uh, in here. There's more content than you could possibly ever consume. But uh, lots of great options in there for you to be able to, to help and train yourself as well. Excellent. OK, uh, that's it, everybody. Uh, oh, let's go on, Basil. Sorry, just one, one, one smaller thing which I would like to mention. So um, uh, can I share my screen for this uh, just very yeah, of quickly? Course. Right. Uh, and this is something I think that will uh, that will help um, a lot of teachers. So we have a uh, we have a site called uh, User Voice. Uh, User Voice is pretty much a site which allows you to suggest new features, to vote on features with, uh, which other teachers have uh, suggested in order for, uh, for them to be made. And basically what happens is as uh, is our internal development team takes a look at these features, evaluates them, and then provides feedback directly in this website. So to access this website, you click on the help tab here, and then you click on suggest a feature. And this will open up uh, the um, user voice website, which is right here. And again, you'll see um, a lot of the different features which uh, teachers have suggested and are pretty much uh, voting on. So one of the top features you'll see is uh, show more than four videos of multiple participants in the meeting or a call. And you'll see that you have uh, an actual um, team, uh, Microsoft Teams uh, admin from the developer team actually come in 
and answer uh, the question. You'll also see a lot of uh, the features have been ta have been tagged as uh, planned uh, or as coming soon uh, or as under review. So this is, uh, th I, I think it's very important for teachers who use Teams on a daily basis to provide their input here. Um, the main reason is we as Microsoft are basically building uh, new features on Teams based entirely on, on the feedback that we're getting from teachers. So this is a product that's basically um, being uh, created and developed based directly on teacher feedback. So I highly um, suggest and welcome uh, each and every one of you to uh, access this website, um, search for topics, uh, sorry, search for ideas which you would like to see actually implemented and vote on them to make sure that our developers uh, kind of take a look at it as well. Um, uh, that's all I wanted to share. I think this is, it, it just provides an easy way for um, uh, for, for uh, you know, direct interaction between um, uh, student, uh, between teachers and between our developers. Classic error there, unmute your microphone, Ed. Um, thank you, Basil, and um, thank you everybody for joining us. Uh, we hope you've learned something here, even if you've taken one idea away. Um, we've tried to answer as many questions as we can. We potentially, in the next week or two, we could have a follow-up session that will be a bit more advanced, uh, get deeper into some of the functions that Microsoft Teams offers, and obviously any new updates. So if there are things that you want Microsoft Teams to do, follow Basil's advice, get on that website and vote for it. Uh, if you don't vote for it, then it, it might not get developed. So. Um, Thanks again to Matt and Neil and Basil. Um, really appreciate your insight today. And um, we, if you are on Twitter, keep an eye on at Neil Statham and at Mr. Mosley. Um, I commented on one of the questions. We will post a link on there so you can download this presentation and watch back and share with your colleagues that might not have been able to make it today. OK, thank you very much, everybody. Have a lovely evening and uh, Ramadan Kareem.